this just as a small welcome to this presentation. Um, that was Enter Sandman by Metallica. And I don't know, maybe some of you have now an image in your head, a memory of a place where you might have heard this, or just an idea of, ugh, I don't like this kind of music, or yay, rock and roll. And um, what I'm here to talk about today is that music permeates a big part of your human society, of our interaction. It is holds a lot of power over us, especially music that is familiar to us. Take, for example, the tradition of many couples or family members having a song. And every time they hear that song, their episodic memory goes back to the context in which they heard this piece of music originally. Um, now, this power of music can be harnessed by institutions over to influence masses of humans can also be used by others to fight those institutions and it can be used by an individual to loudly proclaim their choice of group identity. Take for example punk music. Now I want to talk about something related to the power of music that is usually not really talked about um, and that seems starkly opposed to the positive attributes that we've heard about over the last few days and that we often ascribe to music. And that's music torture. Um, John Calvin already said and believed that music has an insidious and well-nigh incredible power to move us whither it will. So even though it is mostly presented as a very positive phenomenon, and to put it in more contemporary words, it either affects us or it doesn't. There is no way to have the cake and eat it too. It, it, it has power or it doesn't, it doesn't just have positive power. So uh, this is a, a quote from contemporary researchers into torture and musicology who say, even though we have a tendency to, positive on the, uh, to focus on the positive of music, we are confronted with clear indications that it can be used to torture and inflict pain. Now, my question is, within this negative aspect, does society or cultural diplomats, do they have any influence over this? Or is it simply something we have to accept? Now, what I will do in the context of this presentation, I will examine music torture as a cultural and psychological weapon, denigrating human identity, put it in the context of sound and violence generally. And then I will look at the influence that globalization has on this phenomenon and uh, as well as cultural diplomacy initiatives. And we'll finally ask whether in a globalized market and a globalized society, this practice is still viable or if we have increasing power over fighting this. Um, now, due to its property as a site of sensory experience and cultural belief, but also as a medium of cultural expression and our expression of our identity, Music holds, as I already said, very special power over all of us. Within the bigger context of sound and violence or sound and war, um, music has been used to rally the spirits of soldiers, the, the spirits of detainees, take for example Nelson Mandela's prison experience. Um, it can be used to build community or coherent group identity. Um, and it has also been used in a more institutionalized effort, for example, as war propaganda. But within this, because it is embedded in our identity, it can also be used to torture. In this sense, torture means that someone is asserting the absolute power in the face of someone's absolute powerlessness. And because of its cultural characteristics, music has specific advantages over other forms of sound in attacking the human body and spirit. Um, it can itself become the agent of violence. It doesn't just accompany a war propaganda film. It will, can itself attack us. And this synchronization we all experience by simply growing up in the society we grow up in or by going on the internet with a music culture can be used to systematically destroy each and every one of us. Now, this can take one or two, one of two forms. Uh, historically, it's been often used through forced singing of someone else's political anthems, religious anthems, uh, anthems that 
praise something that you're diametrically opposed to, and it's been used more contemporary in what we call uh, enhanced interrogation. And I will focus on enhanced interrogation as these are the most well-documented and analyzed cases in the scientific community. Um, now, music torture itself isn't new. These are just a few of the <coughs> earliest, most well-documented cases. There are cases in the Middle Ages where people think this might be something to do with music torture, but there, there's not enough documentation for them to verify this. These have been academically analyzed and uh, include witness reports. So music has been methodically used to harass, discipline, and even break detainees in a number of countries, but two things have changed for in the 21st century. And one of the first one is that it has come to much wider spread public attention, mainly because it was used in the US war on terror, and people started stepping forward and talking about it. Um, and the official authorization for what we term music, culture, uh, music torture was given in 2003 by General Ricardo Sanchez that yelling, loud music, and light control could be used to create fear, disorient detainees, and prolong capture shock. Uh, the second thing that has changed is that it is no longer just music torturing through noise. It's no longer just because you can't sleep because it's too loud, but that the interrogators and the people employing music torture have discovered and are taking advantage of music's property as the site of sensory experience and cultural identity. Uh, and they're exploiting that through by using what they term culturally offensive music or simply forms of music that the person in question has never come in contact with, such as heavy metal, um, or isn't very familiar with, and that might therefore influence them in a negative way. So that means that someone who's more familiar with this style of music is already better equipped to fight against it and withstand it, but as the accidental torture of an American citizen showed, they're not immuted, even though that was an, a Navy Special Forces soldier who was trained in resisting this kind of enhanced interrogation. Um, there are several diverging opinions on the term torture in this case. I will not go into them, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me about them or any of these cases. I can also forward you articles, uh, whichever you like. Now, it has been said to be worse than any form of physical torture because it attacks the mind and you cannot hide from it. Um, and there, there's actually a two-level effect. There's, on one hand, physical pain through sonic force, simply noise, it hurts. Um, but the most important part is psychological pain. And that, ha that actually comes in two forms. On the one hand, music is used uh, accompanying physical torture. So the minute you hear music, you know, your body knows to expect pain. And your body already pre-experiences this pain, much uh, in the way of Pavlov's psychological conditioning. And uh, the other part is the inter using music as interrogation by itself to reduce mental faculties and disorient, humiliate, and eventually take someone's identity from them by con repeatedly confronting some them with something they perceive as different or humiliating. Um, at the same time, it also serves a dual purpose, not just to interrogate the victims, <coughs> but to also whip the, sol the soldiers or interrogators who use it into a frenzy. And an interrogator wrote in his memoirs that they used it to, quote, strip themselves of their humanity. And that is a very, well, negative but important point. This music torture doesn't just cause someone pain, it actually encourages the people performing it to go further. Um, now, Music torture affects everyone differently, which is another sign of this cultural connectedness music has. And this dual purpose, or in general, the purpose of music torture represents a very convenient loophole in international torture or anti-torture uh, regulations and treaties because it isn't conser considered a form of torture they are mainly focused on the physical aspects of it. Now, my question was, <coughs> we live in an increasingly globalized world. 
does that have any effect on this? And for this, I want to briefly just look at the three main tendencies of the globalization debate. Hyperglobalist just means that we're moving towards a a uh, completely globalized society, no more nation state. <coughs> that uh, would present a very interesting thought experiment, but we can, I can't go into this now, it would take too long, I, wouldn't, I don't have any facts on that, that would simply be as philosophizing. But transformationalists and skeptics do present some very interesting points. The transformationalists believe that we're moving um, towards a hybridization of culture, at the same time we become more global, but we also become more local. And skeptics believe that there will be a counter movement, people clinging to local identities against the perception of overwhelming Western globalization because they're afraid their own cultures will be taken away from them. Now, from that perspective, the transformationalist point of view does reflect many current trends in the music industry and in music consumption. Uh, music is becoming more globally disseminated. We have access to many different forms of music and that would mean that we're better prepared to deal with music torture. But there, I would say there are several reasons why music torture will remain a very viable form of causing humans pain and harm. And that's on the one hand uh, because of the skeptic pers um, perspective. We can see in several European states, but um, also <coughs> in radical Islamist movements, people are clinging and self-representing them based on a very small local identity because they're, f they're fearing that it will disappear, that someone will is trying to take it away from them. And if that happens, and especially because uh, from the US point of view, uh, radical Islamists are the main target for this practice, it will be remain viable to be used on them. Um, on the other hand, the uh, successful musical torture of an American member of the Navy has shown that even if you're familiar with it, it can still cause you mental pain. And uh, even though you're better equipped to fight it, it will still work to some extent to make you doubt your own sanity. And we will always have, as humans, preferences in music or cultural ties based on our upbringings to music and therefore because it is part of our cultural being and our cultural identity someone could always find a way to use this against us no matter what we do um, and even if we let's say all have a very globalized understanding of music we know we're familiar with a lot of music this music used here could be changed to less easily commodified types of music such as for example Beijing opera which would, could still be culturally offensive or culturally uh, foreign to many people and be used that way. Um, now, that, that all sounds really, really negative and really pessimistic, so I'm, but I'm, I'm not trying to say, oh, there is no hope, we will always be in, under this negative influence. Um, but I would say from a legal and a political point of view, there's not really a lot we can do because music torture conveniently presents a twofold legal loophole. Uh, there is no case of copyright infringement because technically if they bought the music and they're not screening it for public profit, the, the music industry can't do anything to forbid them to use this music. And on the other hand, it is not included in international anti-torture regulations. From a political point of view, it would be questionable even if we, f we were able to legally say this is not okay. Um, if the countries who are mostly using it these days, such as the US, would adhere to these regulations and if they would accept it and change their behavior based on this. So from my point of view, what and from what um, a lot of the researchers have also said, we need a globalized societal solution approach. A lot of the artists that have been used uh, for this form of torture have already started uh, public appeals uh, to stop the use of their music, but you can't control any of that. So um, what is needed here, in a sense, is more public awareness, hopefully um, a general ethical education about this topic, I would say, and through that, hopefully, a potential pressure point on practitioners or a reverse effect on people who are practicing it directly, interrogators for example, 
who might start thinking about what it is they're actually doing. Because they're not, not just victims who have directly experienced this and are, as they personally say, no longer able to listen to any form of music, which is very hard in our current society. If you go into a sh store, any form of shop, the radio is usually on, or there's playing some form of music, and they feel physical pain when they have to listen to music. But there are also peripheral victims, namely the artists whose music has been used without their permission, without their, without their intention to cause other people harm. But often these are very actually societally critical music artists who are trying to criticize the government, who are trying to criticize the military. But because they're used on people who are foreign to this music, the subliminal messages such as Killing in the Name of by Metallica still serve a purpose to harm others. Now, one thing that might still stand in the way of this is that uh, some bands actively support this practice. And on the other hand, um, there is a double standard applied to the power of music, even by just in general by society. So when it's used for the power of good, we all very, very strongly believe this. Right? We all very strongly say, yes, we have seen it, we've done it, cultural diplomacy rocks, um, international choir festivals, artists going to places and exchanging with other artists. But when it comes to the negative side of music, a lot of fans will say, oh no, they're just playing. If, if artists live out violent fantasies in their songs, people say, oh, this is, this is their form of expression, but it, will not, it doesn't have any effect on anyone. It doesn't harm anyone. And it does, and there needs to be some awareness that this is a very fine line of freedom of speech. We can't artists tell artists what to do or not, what not to do. That's not the point of this. But to raise the awareness that um, for, for one pr person, this can be enjoyment, critique of the state, critique of an oppressive organization or re regulation, and for someone else, this could lead to a physical and mental harm. So I would hope that we, as cultural diplomats or through cultural diplomatic initiatives and projects, could find some way to lead to a little bit more accountability of these practices, a little bit more awareness, and maybe eventually find approaches that help us deal with this problem. And if we can completely stop it, at least start the way towards finding ways to, to heal the victims, to help them in recovery. Because as yet, there are no approaches to doing so. Uh, no psychological ones, no societal ones. And I believe that uh, cultural diplomacy could be a good first step in that direction. And with that, um, this is basically just a summary of my point that despite the growing awareness and condemnation, it's mostly academics, musicologists, and human rights activists or lawyers who are aware of this. And we should all try to do this so we can fight this together as a society. Thank you very much for your attention. I would hope so, very much. Has it, happened uh, yet? it hasn't happened yet. Okay. So what I've read so far from both um, human rights activists as well as musicologists, and interestingly enough, most of the academic reports of uh, speaking with victims, analyzing that, come from musicologists. Um, they they've said 
it is a very, very tough process to get this accepted into international anti-torture conventions because it has to go through a process of acceptance and a process of screening process and many of the victims are very afraid to come forward and just talk about this publicly and have their face be out there because while this was happening to them, quite a lot of the time they were, si they were forced to sign uh, certain non-disclosure agreements or forms and now they're afraid of what, will, what could happen to them because a lot of them, they weren't, uh, they weren't arrested during a raid or during anything. They were snatched from the street and brought outside their own country. Um, they were you know, dual citizens. They were you know, ordinary citizens. And so for this to start and because um, I think quite a lot of bigger political powers have been implicated in this, it's, it's still questionable whether or not they can achieve this. But nobody is working with the Commission of US reports. Because it's already there. These yeah. people already talked about it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about this. I haven't found any indication that okay. they are. But maybe that was because I was, um, the things I, um, yes, because that's where most of the victim reports I found and that have been analyzed in contemporary cases came from. I know that, um, where was it? It's so music in general, not as a torture form, but it has been used in the training of child soldiers. Um, and that they're, that they're looking for more, but sadly there seems to be a very limited interest from, an, uh, so from, from European uh, researchers or human rights activists that I found. There is one lawyer who, uh, a British lawyer who founded the organization Reprieve, who's uh, who fighting for innocent inmates in Guantanamo, um, and it's part of his, his strate strategy, but he also has to go from a human rights, physical, legal perspective because he says so far, otherwise the, the courts, and especially because he's fighting in the US, won't recognize no, it. No, no, one, so no, no one who's working with Latin America? No, sadly not. Uh, yes, straight here, please. Hi. Hi. Um, and music is related to memory as well, so it's mm -hmm. very painful or joyful yeah. to remember it from the past. If it's a tune that you remember, and I can tell you that Wagner, for mm -hmm. example, you all know Wagner, the operas of Wagner are highly being heard in Israel. Yeah. And you know that? You know the yeah, dispute? Yeah, of course. It's very big dispute about it. Since um, uh, during the Holocaust, there were many Jews on um, concentration camps that were musicians, and they were mm -hmm. forced to play operas of like Wagner at the concentration camps because that was the Goebbels and Hitler's favorite operas. Yeah. And he so was used in many of the propaganda videos. Um, Wagner, who yeah. he, he lived in the 19th century, it wasn't part of the Nazi regime, yeah. but it's so sensitive because it, it, it's a bad memory. And, and there was a dispute to say, but it's a cultural, it's a very important opera, and it's part of our culture. You must, as you said, you cannot play. Yeah. It's so painful. And it was a big dispute. It even went to trial, so it's not being played anymore. Yeah, it was also it was a big dispute in Germany whether or not people tried then retrospectively to look at Wagner's life and see if he had any neo-nationalistic and right-wing tendencies, and people trying to make him out as a right-wing extremist just because his music had been used. So there were many arguments for and against this. And yeah, and you are absolutely right. The memory. I mean, I still get a text from my mom every time a song comes on the radio that was playing on the radio when I was moving out from for the first time. So in a positive memory as well as negative memory, it holds so much power and it doesn't just go away even after generations. Mm -hmm. And that power can always be very easily harnessed by those who are wanting to do harm, sadly. Thank you. Okay, uh, yes, we're gonna go to the front and then we'll come back. Okay. Uh, do you actually know that there are different regulations of this country when you play public music that mm -hmm. uh, in country like UK, you're not allowed to put some F words, for example, mm -hmm. and there are two versions of, uh, of yeah. music. When you go to UK, you will listen to the famous uh, um, hit, and then you go to uh, Germany and you, you, you hear what do you say yeah, about Yeah, there are different words in it. Um, I d I, I'm not 100% sure what to think, because on the one hand, it, it, it seems ridiculous to me. Um, because you suddenly have a break in a song because they couldn't find a word to replace. No, no, no. It, it, um, they don't do break in the song. Ah, okay, they because they here they sometimes they, they, they do, they, they like they Madonna do two, songs. Two, two different, different versions. Mm -hmm. uh, the artists, they do different, two different ver versions. For example, in one song it was, uh, I'm flying very high, or I'm
I'm flying fucking high. Yeah. yeah. And in Germany, you s- you are hearing I'm flying fucking high, or in England, you you are hearing yeah. I'm I'm flying very high. In so yes, also. Sort of thing. Um, <coughs> I think. Um, related to torture, this might oh, not. Yes, uh, but that, yeah. That's, that's public torture for some people because not everybody would like to hear all the time a hundred times. Uh, the word fuck. The, uh, swearing in the public space. True. Um, I think that that. On the other hand, yeah, yeah, of course, it's it's a really I interesting I point. Yeah. yeah. This public torture. I don't want to hear to put ra- a radio and hear all of mm-hmm. hundred times a, fa- a, a, a word. Or yeah. Well, on the on the other hand, um, maybe, maybe it's also yeah. freedom of speech, and y- uh, like there were probably people who would say, well, if you don't want to listen to it, turn it off. Um, yeah, but so that that is, I think, that is the fine line, right? But where music has to be able to say what they want to say because it is a a very powerful instrument to fight, to criticize, to uh, unite people behind a movement. Um, and on the other hand, it depends on the time and the context always, what mu- kind of music is appropriate. But I, w- I would generally say uh, I appreciate hearing the music the, wor- the way the author in- intended. And even if I don't agree with it, um, I know this is what they wanted to express because it is a so very, you, very personal that. thing. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. I think we have time for just uh, one last question here. Mm-hmm. Ah, thank you for reminding me. Mm-hmm. Uh, Metallica is one of the artists who has been repeatedly and documentedly used for, uh, for in music torture. Others include Alice Cooper, Rage Against the Machine, even Christina Aguilera. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and um, what? <laughs> and for example, um, I don't know who here knows the the kids show Barney, oh, yeah. the purple the purple dinosaur Barney. Yeah, exactly that. That's been used to torture people. Yes, yes. And the and the the cr- the, the controversy with that was it came out like new legitimate you know serious newspapers reported this based on. Uh, on well, reports, uh, victim reports, <coughs> and then the creator of Barney came, and the the composer of the song came out and was like, "Well, how is this torture? This is cute. If you played this eight hours for me, I would maybe thank you." So that is the, the big debate also in the public eye that a lot of artists or and a lot of composers and individuals don't take this seriously. They say, "How is this torture? I would love to spend." eight hours in a room listening to Metallica on full volume. But they, what they don't take into account is they have the choice to turn it off. They have the choice to regulate the, the, noi- uh, the, the noise level. Also, they're not sleep deprived, naked, potentially in physical pain, and being ridiculed for the person that they are. So because for the Barney's, who's the target audience? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who's potentially not three. I don't know. So <laughs> the, on- the reports that uh, for where victims have come forward are mostly um, individuals with Middle Eastern, South Asian, or Northern African roots, some, um, some Americans and British citizens. And then, and then and they then just probably, it's I really mean, annoying. I mean, but and, then it's and then the impact after listening that song is it will be um, kind of uh, so the, the impact, it, it's not the specific, so we can't pinpoint this song has this impact because it's personal. But in general, what these songs impact, they don't play them once. They play them 24 hours on a loop at a decibel level that is also physically painful. Um, you're naked, you can't sleep, you're potentially in a stressed position, you're afraid, and you're in a room that vibrates really well. And so what happens is um, you're in physical pain, uh, you cannot hear yourself think, you're disoriented, um, and when you start, when you, from what they've described, I mean, I've not luckily personally experienced this, but from what, what was described is that you, because you cannot hear yourself think, you cannot gather yourself to f- potentially fight back. So your mind just slowly slips away from you, and you lose basically the will to fight back and the will to gather rational thought. And after you come out of this, Um, There was a BBC documentary about a British, I think a British Pakistani citizen who uh, was subjected to this and he says if I hear any music, I'm in pain. If I hear music that was used to torture me, I have a violent physical flashback and I had to be admitted to the hospital for that.
think we're going to wrap things up right there. Uh, let's thank our spe final speaker one last time. Very interesting talk. And if anyone just has more questions or wants to read some of the literature, feel free. I have it, sadly. <laughs>